Hello, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, if at any time during the next hour you have any questions, please submit them via your control panel via the questions option. Um, we will also be using the last 10 minutes for a question and answer as well. I would like to welcome you to the Emerging Scholar and Professional Organization of the Gerontological Society of America's first webinar of their professional development series entitled Increasing the Odds That Your Manuscript Will Be Published, which will be presented by Dr. Merrill Silverstein. Dr. Silverstein is the Marjorie Cantor Professor of Aging Studies at Syracuse University and the editor of one of GSA's journals, the Journals of Gerontology Series B, Social Sciences. I will now hand it over to you, Dr. Silverstein. Okay, thank you very much, Megan, um, and thanks uh, to all the um, ESPO representatives and the uh, Gerontological Society for uh, putting this on. Um, what I'm going to do in the next um, hour is talk about um, strategies that you can uh, take to increase the chances of uh, publishing in peer-reviewed journals uh, with an emphasis on the uh, GSA journals. Um, as we all know, um, publishing is um, probably the single best thing you can do in an academic career uh, for um, your promotion and success. So this is a very important uh, skill set to learn. So with that in mind, um, I want to give you just a brief background um, of where I sit uh, relative to the um, editorial uh, process. Um, uh, Megan, if you can go to the next slide. Um, as you can see, uh, GSA publishes a variety of journals. I'm not going to talk about each one except to locate where um, I'm situated, uh, the Journals of Gerontology Series B. Uh, Series B combines uh, social science and psychological sciences. We're two separate journals with two different editors, two different editorial boards, um, but we do um, uh, share a, 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 each issue. We're bound together, um, and we also share an impact factor. Um, what, I'm, what I'll talk about in social science can pretty much be extrapolated to psychological sciences. So I think there's, there's enough overlap if there are any psychologists um, in the group. And you can see our new, um, our new covers, which were uh, designed to, uh, to look uh, colorful and, and attractive. So I hope you appreciate that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, this gives you an idea of the uh, Journals of Gerontology Series B um, areas um, in which um, uh, we publish. And you can see the fields are quite broad, ranging from you know, anthropology uh, to sociology and alphabetical order. But in between, you can see uh, disciplines that, that generally are, are, are rarely seen in the journal, but, are, but we're certainly open to, and, and that would include political science, uh, geography, epidemiology, uh, economics. Um, so we're very broad in capturing a uh, full array of uh, social science uh, specializations and, and disciplines. Uh, we generally um, uh, entertain uh, five uh, different types of contributions, which you see listed. Uh, the most common is the original research report. This is your uh, standard research article, uh, followed by uh, brief reports, which um, are probably about half the length. We're, we're talking there about um, 2,500 to 3,000 words, where the original research reports are generally in the 5,000 word range. Um, there's very little difference in the, um, I'd say no difference in the way uh, these two are um, uh, cited on your CV should you be published. So brief reports are often a good way to um, have an article that you might think is more modest to, to get that into print. Um, but in terms of percentage, 80-90% um, of our submissions are original research reports. And then you see other um, uh, types of submissions as well, review articles, theoretical or methodological um, articles and commentaries. These are relatively rare, and um, the bar is fairly high to uh, publish uh, an article that's not a research report, um, but, but we do on occasion uh, publish those. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the criteria for uh, success um, in publishing in JGSS, and, and again, I think this, this um, overlaps not only to psychological sciences, but to other journals in the social and behavioral and policy sciences, um, um, but especially, I think, in our journal, is that uh, we want articles to be uh, theory-driven and rooted in a social science foundation. Um, what, what I mean by that is that there has to be uh, uh, an architecture, um, um, a theoretical uh, conceptualization. Uh, the article um, cannot be uh, simply an empirical test. It has to be embedded uh, within um, some sort of a framework that's, that's well known. 
um, and advance that framework in some way. So uh, I'm not saying that um, uh, theory has to be very complicated, but I, I, I think, in the, especially in the social sciences, um, theory is very much um, uh, prized by uh, not only our reviewers, but, but our readers um, as well. Uh, articles, of course, have to move knowledge forward in the field of gerontology. Uh, how much it has to move forward is, is um, uh, sort of a fluid um, um, criterion, um, but it does have to uh, add to our knowledge base. Um, where many junior scholars question me um, is about what is my methodology uh, sophisticated enough? And, and I always say, well, if it's uh, up to the task of, of answering your research questions, then it is. So uh, it should be rigorous enough to be up to date and, and uh, handle um, most of the issues that um, uh, would be um, considered methodological um, uh, quirks. Uh, but it should also be appropriate uh, to the uh, questions being, um, being addressed. Um, I can't overestimate how important um, good writing is and how um, important it is to focus uh, on the uh, research uh, problem that you um, want to um, address, uh, to not be too generalized in, in your presentation of, um, of the research problem, um, and, and also to be um, what I call comprehensible without being too comprehensive. That is, you want to communicate well what it is you want to say, uh, but not try to explain the world and be too comprehensive, too sweeping in, in what you're trying to explain in your research. Um, as an editor, and this is probably true for many editors, um, uh, I, I try to give more leeway uh, to uh, junior scholars who uh, may be, maybe need um, more extensive um, hand-holding, more um, detailed review. Uh, scholars from developing countries and, and areas that are typically underrepresented um, and also understudied topics uh, such as um, HIV, AIDS, and aging, um, and um, under-investigated areas of the world such as Africa and South America where we get very few um, manuscripts from. Uh, next slide, please. Um, one of the uh, first choices um, you'll make when you um, have finished um, writing your article, or at least before you finish writing, uh, which I find it's, it's much easier to actually target a journal in your mind while you're writing the piece, um, is, to, is to choose the, the right journal uh, for, your, for your paper. Uh, I put right in quotes because there are several ways you can think about what's right and what's not right. So um, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about that. Then um, branch into um, qualities of the paper that will put it on a path to acceptance, things that are, are within your control. Uh, that can help you along, uh, discuss some common pitfalls, um, then uh, branch into handling um, uh, the, uh, the return of uh, review of your article. Um, if it is a revise and resubmit, uh, there would be a certain strategy, and then how to handle rejection, which is um, always difficult for us to do. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to pose a poll question, and I, I, I think um, uh, Megan is going to handle the responses, and, and we'll see the results. Um, uh, and the qu first question is, for those um, who submitted manuscripts, how did you select the journal uh, for you, that you used for submission? And I'll, I guess I'll pause a minute, and we'll see the results on this. One second. Okay.
So Mero, the highest response is 65% with my mentor slash advisor suggested the journal, mm -hmm. followed by about 50% um, I have read papers from this journal, and coming in third is 25% the journal I selected high, had a high impact factor. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's, um, that's all very interesting. So um, uh, mentor advisor um, uh, seems to be a very influential uh, person in the process. So that's that's uh, um, probably as it should be. Um, these are people who um, would be uh, very well positioned to uh, to be giving you advice. Let me go through um, a couple of um, uh, uh, ideas here about how uh, you might also want to think about broadening um, your thinking about where to submit. Um, and I think there are four in here. The first is um, what I call fit-based. Uh, that is, um, does your research uh, fit? within um, the journal's mandate and within the collection of articles that are generally published in that journal? Is it in the right camp um, of articles? Um, does it promote continuity um, of, of within, the, um, within the journal itself? Um, the, the, this strategy um, has an um, advantage that you would um, uh, probably get reviewers who are uh, fairly uh, familiar with the ideas uh, of your article as well as the, the jargon. We all use jargon occasionally, um, but at least for the assumptions that you uh, make within the article are more likely to find a, a friendlier um, reception. Uh, one easy way to, to um, uh, determine whether the fit is, is good is to look at the, uh, your references and see if you're citing articles that are published um, in the journal. The second um, audience, um, the second um, uh, group of uh, uh, way of thinking about this is uh, what I call audience-based. That is, um, who reads the journal? Um, are they uh, people uh, in your uh, discipline? Um, is it a multidisciplinary audience? Um, does your um, does the uh, a journal is the journal sponsored by a professional organizations such as ours being sponsored by GSA? Uh, the advantage of that is that there's a built-in audience that. Um, uh, can um, uh, will get something more perhaps out of out of your article than if you published in a uh, journal that catered to your discipline, whether that's sociology or psychology or, or uh, public health. Um, I think this is a kind of an important fork in the road um, as you uh, think about this, uh, because some um, uh, departments uh, will um, prize your disciplinary journals, uh, which would be more uh, general in, in some sense. Uh, unless your discipline is gerontology, and then um, journal of gerontology might be uh, preferred, um, uh, versus a um, more content-related um, um, audience, which I think uh, gerontology would fit because we have different disciplines represented. Uh, the um, another um, strategy is to um, uh, you can skip to the to the oh I'm sorry here we go fit based yeah um, is um, no if you can go to the next one. Yes, thank you. Um, is a status based, and this has to uh, do with the um, impact factor, uh, uh, the selectivity, uh, perhaps of, of the journal. Uh, the impact factor, very briefly, is the average number of citations uh, each paper receives in that journal um, uh, it, during a two-year uh, period. So uh, basically, you can think of it as the average uh, citation count. Uh, for the average article in that um, particular journal. Uh, the impact factor is very highly discipline um, dependent. Um, so in the biological sciences, uh, an impact factor of 5 to 8 is not uncommon and very considered very good, where in the social sciences we, we see more in the 1 to 3 range, where um, if you're over 3, um, you're doing very well. Now the Journal of Gerontology Series B just hit the 3 mark. Uh, 3.06, I believe, in the last uh, round. So uh, we're kind of pushing up in terms of um, our um, impact and, and uh, uh, status within the, the range of, of journals that you can publish in. Um, another metric is the rejection rate. Uh, journals that generally have high rejection rates um, are also considered highly selective and have more uh, prestige at, attached to them. But impact factor is the one that's public knowledge, and you'd be able to to look at that online and make a determination. Um, one strategy that I've used over the years is to, um, if you have several articles um, in process, uh, to aim high. Um, one, maybe your, be your better article, 
a name kind of medium or low on another, which would give you increased chances of publication, but in a lower ranked journal to try to cover all your bases. Uh, next, please. Um, knowing the culture of the journal is also very important. Um, I think to ask yourself these questions as you uh, move along would be important. Um, is the journal uh, more theory-based? Does it uh, deal with basic or applied research? Um, because Journal of Gerontology Series B has more of an emphasis on theory, an article that um, is uh, purely applied, even an important one, uh, would probably not find a good home in our journal. Um, so I, I, again, I, I think that thinking about how a theory um, kind of is, forms the basis for your for your ideas is uh, is, a, is a crucial uh, dividing line. Um, is there a methodological tradition uh, to the journal? Um, does it publish only quantitative, only qualitative, or mixed methods kinds of research? Now, the Journal of Gerontology Series B uh, does all of these, but quite frankly, 90%, if not more, um, I think are quantitative, and we're always kind of looking for um, uh, scholars who are uh, doing good qualitative work uh, to submit. Um, does the journal um, have a disciplinary or multidisciplinary uh, focus? Uh, ours uh, certainly is multidisciplinary, but again, in the social sciences. So uh, a, an article coming in uh, that looks at um, an intervention uh, or a program evaluation um, which, uh, again, may be very good, um, or uh, looking at a particular disease prevalence um, is maybe uh, too narrow uh, for the kind of um, article that we, we tend to um, tend to publish. Um, you can also communicate with editors directly. Um, this is something that I think junior scholars, and, and certainly when I was a junior scholar, I didn't think was possible to uh, write, um, send an email to the editor, uh, send maybe a title, a few sentences, maybe an abstract, uh, to say, is this uh, relevant? Is something that you uh, might um, might consider um, uh, putting in review? And um, uh, almost all the time, editors will uh, provide uh, feedback to you, and this is very valuable. You can also see them in person, often at professional meetings and different workshops. And um, editors um, do not mind. In fact, they, they like being approached. You can go, you can go to the next. Um, there are things you can also do to um, kind of improve your critical skills and um, your uh, strategizing in, in trying to publish. Um, and two of them I list here. One is reviewer and training, uh, which is uh, basically coming up to an editor and asking to, uh, uh, to be a, a reviewer uh, of an article. And that could be the third or fourth reviewer uh, of an article that's, uh, that's been submitted to the journal. Uh, or uh, be a mentored reviewer, in which case your mentor would be the reviewer and you would participate and add to the uh, commentary. And, and this, I think, is a very good learning experience. Uh, either way, um, uh, I think you can uh, really gain insight into the publication process. And uh, one of the reasons is that you get to uh, not only uh, do the review um, uh, yourself or, or with a mentor, but uh, you get to read the other reviews and the editor's letters, so you get to see from the inside um, how the uh, critical process uh, works, how your review gets then summarized and, um, and fed back uh, to the author. So being on that side of things is very useful uh, for educating yourself about uh, how to uh, present your own papers uh, to um, a peer-reviewed journal. So this will really sharpen your ability to, to craft uh, what I call a winning article and avoid um, potential problems uh, down the road. You can see what it is that reviewers are, are calling for um, uh, in, in their critiques. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about scientific merit because that gets into some very nuts and bolts details. But there are things you can do to um, improve your chances of publishing. And one of them, I say, is don't alienate the reviewers um, or uh, the editor. And uh, what alienates reviewers and editors? Um, well, if uh, uh, your article does not conform to the journal style and standards um, in terms of simple things like references or creating sections, um, uh, I get manuscripts, that, let's say, that um, are not formatted in, in the abstract the way we, we have uh, in the instructions on the website. Uh, initially, um, that really shouldn't be a problem, but it, it does um, tip off the editor that the, the author was not um, uh, doing due diligence to, uh, 
to conform to the uh, to the journal. And maybe this was an article that was uh, recycled from from a, a rejection earlier on, which is fine. But what you want to do is is show respect for the journal by by conforming to the um, to the requirements. So stay as close as you can to the word and page limits. Um, if you do go over the word limit, it's usually a nice courtesy to uh, to write to the editor to ask if it's okay. Uh, I can't, um, again, overestimate the importance of writing clearly um, as well as concisely. Uh, you don't have a lot of space to uh, write, and you're often writing uh, fairly complex ideas. So um, writing as um, um, accurately um, and expressing your ideas as cogently as possible without using um, more words than necessary is, is the goal. And these, um, uh, the, the, the easier an article is to read, um, all things being equal, uh, the better your chances are at getting published. You should, in your writing, um, make logical arguments uh, where the paper kind of smooths, uh, flows smoothly between the different sections. Um, uh, often uh, people use the um, metaphor of uh, telling a story to um, uh, uh, make um, the flow of the article um, um, more um, uh, fluid. And I think um, this is, of course, easier said than done. But I think it's it's um, uh, important to have your literature review uh, match the uh, research questions, which then match the method, um, which then matches the discussion. That is, it should be a linear, a linear flow. Um, don't alienate reviewers um, and editors by using acronyms. Um, I often get um, articles that have seven or eight different acronyms, and it can get very confusing. Um, this makes it more difficult to review. And then the last thing I'll say is don't try to do too much. Um, uh, often junior uh, scholars um, are a bit insecure about their contribution to the literature and want to uh, use three or four theories or um, try to go into a very um, detailed explanation about every variable in their model, let's say. Um, I think it's important to realize that you're only um, explaining part of a particular social issue, um, not the whole world of it. So uh, try to uh, keep that kind of modesty in mind and, and keep your eye on the ball. What is it that you're really trying to explain um, in your article? Um, and if it turns out that maybe you're doing too much, it could be that you want to break this article up into two or possibly three uh, different articles. Uh, next, please. Um, maybe um, after this slide, um, I will uh, take some questions. So I just want you to, to think about what those might be. Um, so good practices. Um, I mentioned um, submitting to um, a journal um, whose um, articles you're citing. Um, uh, but even if you're not, um, doing that, um, you should make every effort to at least have one or two if it's uh, possible to, uh, to do, because it's good policy uh, to uh, show that you're familiar enough with the journal to have uh, at least several uh, citations from, from that journal. Uh, again, maintain the conventions of the journal and scientific publishing more generally that are used uh, headings and, and section labels that um, are, um, uh, are the type that are usually seen in peer-reviewed publications. And then if, um, if you have a reviewer in mind uh, that you think might be good for the, your particular article, um, you can, there is space to, uh, to do that, make that recommendation. And uh, I find that um, that can be helpful when, when searching for a reviewer or uh, when um, we don't get enough reviewers because uh, the ones we've asked were too busy or declined to do the review. Um, it's not uncommon uh, for us to uh, then pick uh, one of the recommended reviewers uh, from the author's list. Um, <clears throat> you could also put in uh, people who you prefer um, not to be a reviewer. And um, uh, we also, uh, at least I honor that um, uh, pretty well. Uh, in terms of um, getting to that point where the article is smoothly uh, expressed and um, elegantly phrased, um, I'd have to say uh, to proofread it, proofread it, proofread it, and then get somebody else to proofread it. Um, nothing will be perfect, but I think you want to get all the kinks out, and that takes some time to uh, to, to, to have it uh, read, 
read over, have somebody else look at it uh, to uh, to improve the um, uh, expression, but also to, uh, to to pick out the mistakes and flaws that uh, you might want to correct. So I'm going to pause here just for a couple of minutes, and um, I think Megan's going to look at the um, questions if they've come in and, and then pose a couple to me. Meryl, I have one question that says, I have difficulty determining whether to target a specialty journal that will get my point <clears throat> or a journal with a more general audience to whom I want to spread the word. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, this is, this is um, a common um, conundrum. And um, uh, I think if, um, I'm assuming this person is, is a junior scholar, maybe a graduate student, um, I think it's um, better to play it safe to, um, if you think the specialty journal is going to uh, recognize the contribution uh, of more uh, than a more generalist uh, journal, um, I would say uh, go to that journal because it'll be familiar with your language, with your ideas, with the way you're expressing it, um, your, your, the research problem, uh, which I think would um, increase your chances of publication. So uh, you want to get your foot in the door. You want to get something published um, early on. Um, I think it's better to take that route, and then later on you can go to a more generalist journal um, where I think the competition will be more um, diverse and, and maybe more intense even uh, to uh, then uh, try to get a, a broader recognition. Um, as you move along in your career, I think you'll, you'll want to do that uh, to get the uh, broader uh, readership um, uh, for um, getting a job and, and, and also down the road getting, getting promoted and getting tenure. Okay, so was that uh, the only one, Megan? Nope, there are nope. several. Um, I'll take one more. Okay, one more. Um, how do we choose reviewers when we're required to provide this at time of submission? Uh, <clears throat> well, it, it won't be required. Um, it'll be um, an option for you to take. Um, how you do it is, again, I think if you're, if you're junior, um, you should have a consultation uh, with your mentor to can um, uh, make a recommendation about what reviewers um, might be particularly um, keyed into the kind of research problem uh, you're focusing on um, and who um, might also be more fair in their evaluation. Um, it definitely would take somebody with a broader overview of the field to know who those reviewers are. Um, but if you're doing it on your own, of course, you could look at your reference list. And if you're citing somebody three or four times, this could be a candidate you want to recommend. Now, this person would probably, probably be on the radar of the editor anyway, uh, but it doesn't hurt to make that kind of recommendation. OK, so let me continue on. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, common problems that lead to um, an instant rejection of your article. Um, uh, at the um, Journal of Gerontology Series B, um, we instantly reject um, about 50% of the articles that come in. Uh, and these are some of the more general reasons. So these are things you definitely want to avoid uh, just to get into, um, into review. Um, the first, of course, is um, if it's a poor fit to the journal. And the poor fit could come from uh, addressing an issue that is off the radar for the journal, um, that your uh, approach is stylistically um, different than what the journal publishes. Uh, maybe the methodology you use is uh, not, um, uh, doesn't conform to what's usually seen in the journal. Um, but it's amazing to me that people do submit uh, articles that are uh, so far off base, it's been cl it's clear to me that they never read the journal before, and they're just uh, fishing around to uh, get it reviewed. So I, I, I know that won't apply uh, to any of you out there. Um, but um, it could if your work, um, uh, let's say, is too applied. Uh, and that's another um, reason that we do not uh, accept uh, articles. That is, they, they might be uh, medically based and looking at some kind of medical intervention. Uh, which might um, have a social variable, but essentially is not a social science uh, article. Uh, another reason is that the article uh, might not make a strong case for advancing the literature. That is, it might have 
uh, very little uh, roots or shallow roots um, in the literature. Um, that is, it's kind of coming um, at the problem um, without really examining or considering the history of, of what's been done in, in the area. Uh, the third reason is that the article um, might be um, a replication of what's been done before. Um, it might provide some improvement to knowledge, um, but that improvement might be trivial. Uh, so a good example of that is an article that comes in that says, um, uh, I'm going to uh, test um, hypotheses X, Y, and Z, but I'm going to um, uh, do it. It's been done many times before, but I'm going to do it in a new context or a new country. Um, that by itself is not reason enough to uh, merit um, entry into the review process or toward publication. Um, it needs to um, say, well, what is it about the new context or the new country that might make replication um, uh, produce a different kind of result? And what are the theoretical reasons uh, for it? Uh, so I think by itself, replication is not reason enough for um, publication. Um, and improvement to knowledge, uh, yes, important. Uh, but if it is um, essentially um, adding one more variable to a, a list of um, things we know about, that might not quite uh, make the cut. Um, the other the next reason is that the article might not emerge from the literature. It purports uh, to advance. That is, it could be a literature review in the article, and then it branches into a, a whole different area. We've seen that, um, especially with regard to hypotheses, um, hypothesis generation, and the listening of research questions. It, those, those have to link to the kind of um, review that you've done of the literature earlier on to um, uh, propose that there's a gap in our knowledge and how you're going to fill it. Um, the last is that um, more of an empirical issue, um, that the data set, the variables, the study design, or the um, methodological approach are not adequate uh, to the uh, kinds of questions that you're, that you're addressing. Uh, next one, please. Um, there are several other things you also um, want to think about. Um, in terms of um, improving your communication skills. Um, often an article might come in um, where the assumption is that the editor and reviewers will uh, find that the research um, is interesting and makes a contribution. Um, but, but this is not always the case. It's not always apparent to somebody who's maybe outside or tangentially related to your field. I think you have to make the case uh, that um, uh, what we know uh, what we don't know, and how your article is going to, to fill that gap. Um, often this is couched in a, a problem. Oh, there we go. Uh, this is couched in a failure to address why uh, uh, the research is important and how it extends the literature. Um, and often is the case, the uh, article, uh, an article that doesn't make this sort of or make this kind of um, communication uh, does not have uh, research questions or hypotheses to guide the research. And I think this is very important. Uh, um, I, I don't say that every article has to have formal hypotheses. Uh, it's, a, it's a preference. Um, if it has research questions that articulate uh, where the research, uh, what, what it's addressing and where it's going, uh, this provides a, a roadmap uh, essentially for the rest of the paper and, and helps in understanding what the results uh, mean in the end and help also you in, in pr producing a, a discussion section. So um, research questions, yes. Hypotheses, yes. Um, both um, would probably be preferable. Um, and it really benefits you um, as well as the, the uh, reviewers and editors in terms of making their lives easier, in terms of trying to understand what it is you're trying to do. Uh, next one, please. Um, two, two opposite um, problems uh, would be that the article um, might do too much, that it's overly complex. Uh, articles that um, try to rely on three or four different theories, all of which maybe um, overlap or um, are, are redundant in some way or cannot be um, individually uh, confirmed. Um, uh, it, it produces too much complexity. 
uh, for um, the research, um, kind of research that, that we generally do. And uh, uh, an article that does uh, too much um, really um, doesn't do much of anything, in a sense, because there's just too much uh, detail to kind of make sense. Is, is there are too many trees and not enough forest. Uh, the other problem is that the analysis is uh, maybe too simple. Um, I've rejected articles out of hand that, um, um, not necessarily because of this, but this would be a symptom. Uh, use, um, let's say, uh, you know, cross taps uh, rather than multivariate equations, which um, are almost always necessary for the kind of work that we do in quantitative work. Um, in qualitative work, the um, uh, quotations from from subjects um, uh, might be uh, too brief and, and do not uh, reflect the richness of, of the responses. So, and so I, I've seen a few of, of those on, on the qualitative end. So I think you know you want to hit a happy medium, not too complex, not too simple, not too cold, not too hot, but just right. Um, another issue is uh, that alter alternative explanations for the findings are, are, are there, but are not um, acknowledged or unincorporated, um, you're, you're never going to be able to um, uh, explain, um, of course, 100% of some phenomenon. Um, but if you um, have, um, um, let's say, a significant uh, variable in your model, um, you want to make sure that the alternative explanations are um, accounted for as best as possible. Again, nothing is going to be perfect. But for instance, if you have a of an effect of, uh, of race on some kind of outcome, but you're not controlling <coughs> for socioeconomic uh, variables, <coughs> excuse me, um, you would, um, I, I think, leave yourself open to um, the issue that you're, you're really um, uh, falsely attributing an effect to one, one factor when it could be um, related to um, an unincorporated one. Um, often is the case that um, in articles that are rejected, uh, that the discussion section is, is simply a recapitulation of the findings, just a review of what was found using different kind of language, but not really an interpretation of the results, um, uh, no real discussion of directions for future uh, research. Um, I guess the most fixable problem, um, but one that, that can put an article over the edge to rejection would be uh, language language issues. Uh, spelling errors and inattention to detail. Now, if English is not your native language, um, uh, and the article looks like it could be compelling, and and and, and it's really just an issue of, of syntax, uh, perhaps, um, um, my recommendation is often to get a native English speaker to to help uh, with the with the article. Um, so it's not uh, necessarily a fatal flaw, but um, it will make it more difficult. Um, for an article to be processed um, by both me and, and reviewers. Uh, and that could put it over the edge to rejection. So you really want to take care of this before I have to uh, make that recommendation. Uh, next, please. All right, our poll question number two. Uh, for those who received the revise and resubmit for a submitted manuscript, what were your next steps? We have 66% that have voted, mm -hmm. and 85% have selected revised paper and resubmitted. 
Amen. And the other responses are receiving very little responses. <laughs> There is, it's posted on the screen, right? Okay. Well, that's what um, I would have expected, um, that um, almost everyone will submit back to the same uh, journal. Um, you should uh, probably do it in the amount of time that the editor uh, gives you. Um, if you need more time, you could always ask. Um, okay. So we can go back to the, to the slides when you have a chance. Okay. So revise and resubmit. Um, you know, you can congratulate yourself, pat yourself on the back. You have your foot in the door. Uh, the reviews may be may be harsh. Um, you may actually disagree with some of them, um, but you're 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 at least in the game. So this is a, a very important um, uh, a moment for you. Um, you probably haven't read your article in some time, so you have uh, the opportunity to kind of gain a fresh perspective on reading it again. And the faults that um, maybe you didn't see the first time will, will pop out at you. This is uh, invariably uh, the case. Um, as you're going through the article and reading the um, critique from the reviewers, uh, you should make a list uh, for yourself of the major and minor uh, issues and the changes you intend to make. Uh, uh, the editor uh, will um, uh, prioritize what the most important changes um, uh, that will be necessary, so you should uh, take that very seriously. Um, the, the editor, in some way, is um, like a, a referee who is um, taking a lot of input from the reviewers and sorting them in, in his or her mind and then providing to the author what would be most important. Um, there might be issues that um, you disagree with. Um, you should think very hard about whether you want to contest those um, those issues. Um, but uh, mostly, you're going to follow the editor's um, uh, point of view on what um, what changes would be required to uh, uh, to move toward publication. Um, as you're making changes, of course, you're you're probably adding to the manuscript, so you have to really be careful about not making the manuscript too long. So. You might have to cut other uh, sections as well, so you want to be very careful that you're uh, still maintaining the right balance in the, in the argument that you're maintaining in the in the um, in the article. So we'll cut judiciously. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Um, once your article is ready to resubmit, um, you would then compose uh, an editor, a letter to the editor and, and the reviewers um, that you would go through the uh, main points um, one by one and explain uh, succinctly how you address them and on what pages it can be found. This is very important so that reviewers can uh, find where those changes are. Um, I think most journals, and we, we just started doing this, we, we um, I think ask the um, uh, author to highlight the um, uh, changes in bold or in red so that it's more easily found. Um, if there are suggestions you don't agree with, um, and again, those should be rare, you should explain uh, why you disagree. Uh, don't simply ignore the suggestion by the reviewer. This will uh, alienate them, especially if it's an important point. So you really need to address every issue um, of significance. Uh, there are going to be a lot of small suggestions, typos, um, you know, mild, mild changes in wording. I don't think you need to address every single one except in a very broad statement that you've taken the suggestion of the reviewer uh, to make the kind of edits that were recommended. Um, if a change you think is um, uh, not necessary um, and you provided a very reasoned ar argument uh, for uh, holding your ground, I think um, uh, then you you, um, you you need to do that in a nice uh, way um, with a very good explanation. So for that, I think you can write a little bit more. Uh, again, all this letter should be fairly concise. Um, sometimes um, reviewers will ask you to put in um, a variable, let's say, in your um, model that um, really is outside the scope of your research but is kind of a pet uh, uh, area for that reviewer. And in that case, I think you can uh, say that your research is um, um, devoted to a particular topic and you don't want to delve outside of that, um, that boundary uh, that, that, that you have in, in your 
um, in your ideas. So I, I, I think this is one example of what reviewers might suggest that then you can counter uh, by um, politely resisting that suggestion. Uh, next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> I think it's important to realize that no research is perfect and there will always be flaws. Um, what you really want to do is convince the reviewers that the flaws are not fatal. Essentially, that's the task here, that, um, uh, that um, uh, your imp the imperfections in the research um, do not invalidate uh, the ultimate conclusions that you're going to make. So you write the letter, you thank the editor, you thank the reviewers for providing you the opportunity to resubmit uh, that their comments were very helpful um, and really put a very good face on it, even if you don't feel that way in inside. Uh, next, please. Uh, poll question three, for those who received a rejection, uh, what were your next steps? We have 60% that have voted, and the number one response has been revised paper and submitted to another journal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that um, is um, normally the, the route uh, that's uh, taken, uh, to take um, uh, some of the criticism uh, to heart and uh, revise your article accordingly and, and move it on to another journal. So we'll, we'll go to the next Those slide. The yeah. And we'll go on to the next screen. Here we go. OK, so if you get rejected, first thing is don't panic. Uh, it, it's happened to all of us. Uh, certainly, it's happened to me. What you, should you do next? Should you tank the article? Uh, no, I think taking a deep breath and, and, and kind of put, putting everything away for a little while is, is actually a good idea to let the sting of the rejection fade. Um, and then after a certain amount of time, when you're disappointment of being rejected or your anger at being rejected is, is subsiding. You read the re, uh, reviews again. Uh, you have the benefit of these reviews. So you should take advantage of them in revising the manuscript for another journal. Um, one of the uh, best pieces of advice, not that I follow this all the time, only in very selective cases, that you could even try a higher ranked journal when after you've revised it and, and submit it, uh, submitted it again. Um, so you should do this relatively uh, quickly so that the article doesn't, um, doesn't linger and is still fresh in your mind. Uh, next, please. Um, you should use the reviews you got uh, from the um, uh, rejection to um, uh, focus on what I call the fatal flaws, what, what really um, uh, were pointed, what, what issues were pointed out that really determined this decision. Not every single um, critique, uh, not every single piece of a every single piece of a critique is going to be uh, important for you. Uh, there may be some idiosyncratic suggestions that will not come up again in, in, in future reviews. So I think you want to be judicious in, in, in taking those um, criticisms and, and um, adjusting your your uh, new article um, accordingly. Um, you might be rejected again, actually, and. Um, I have to tell you, one of my most cited articles was rejected uh, twice before uh, it was published by a third um, journal. So you should keep trying. Uh, most articles have a home somewhere. Um, academics um, have to develop a, a thick skin because rejection is part of the game, whether it's uh, submitting articles or submitting grant proposals for review. Uh, peer review can be a, a, a nasty and brutal game, but it is survivable. And you have to really kind of know how to navigate through it. And, and I've given you, I think, some tips about how uh, to, uh, to improve your chances um, in, in this uh, process. Uh, next, please. Um, 
this cartoon I thought was about right um, to explain the um, uh, peer review uh, process. Uh, you have to jump through uh, quite a few hoops. Uh, those hoops will uh, provide you with uh, uh, some uh, resistance and uh, maybe even a little bit of uh, punishment. Um, might question uh, your your assumptions about uh, uh, how good your article um, really was, but the ultimate game here is to improve the science. And um, if you've um, gone through peer review process, and most of them are, are very good ones, uh, you will notice that the end product is, is much better than the first thing uh, that you submitted. I know that's true for me, um, and I think it's true for almost everybody who's gone through this. Um, uh, yes, uh, there uh, can be egos uh, bruised. Um, yes, uh, there um, might be extra work that you would have preferred not to do. Uh, but in, in the end, I think the science is much improved uh, through, um, through the process. Uh, one example I'll give you and then take some uh, questions in the next slide. Um, I think one of the, um, I'll wait for that slide. Um, oh, you can go to the next one, yeah. Um, uh, oh, no, you can skip that one. Um, uh, one of the most cited articles um, in the history of economics uh, was uh, published by uh, George um, Ekerloff uh, called The Market for Lemons. It was about um, the um, supply and demand for uh, used cars. And um, he um, published this on the fourth attempt in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. So he was rejected three times. Uh, here is a, a Nobel Prize winning um, economist who, uh, whose article eventually got 2,000 uh, plus uh, citations uh, who had to withstand uh, three rejections. Now, each of those rejections provided him with reviews that, that possibly um, allowed him to increase the quality along the pathway to publication. So those rejections could have been, could have been useful to him in, in, in some fundamental way. So what I want to say is that rejection is part of the, of the uh, process, um, but in some ways rejection can be your friend if it um, certainly was um, Professor Ekerlof's friend. So um, uh, this is a, a story that um, I think you should keep telling yourself um, after, um, after a particularly disheartening rejection. Uh, next, please. I think we're almost done. Ah, yes. Final piece of advice. Um, you can't publish if you don't submit. Um, one of the, I think, uh, tragedies I've seen among junior faculty is uh, that um, they don't ever think their article is good enough to submit. Again, nothing is going to be perfect. Um, this is, I think, why it's important to have mentors or colleagues read your manuscript to see if it's passed some kind of invisible threshold that would make it, um, I think, um, uh, useful to to uh, to have um, to have reviewed. Um, very smart people, uh, uh, very good potential scholars, have uh, stalled their careers because they have not um, had the confidence to submit their work. Uh, uh, it's easy to see the flaws in your work. Um, of course, other people see it too, but um, passing that, that threshold of acceptability um, is important uh, to know where that thin line is. And uh, uh, if you can't find it yourself, again, get help to have somebody look it over to um, determine uh, whether it's ready for prime time. Um, so um, I'm going to end it there. I have, I guess, five minutes for questions. Uh, I want to thank again uh, the GSA, uh, Megan, and, and the ESPO um, representatives for giving me the opportunity to, to speak with you. Thank you, Meryl. We do have some questions um, that I would like to ask of you. Uh, one person asked if you recommended having a brief introductory section uh, before a longer background, or is it better to begin with one large introduction slash background in your manuscript? That's a very good question. Um, I've certainly seen it both ways, and uh, I can't say that I have a preference. But the longer the introduction is, the probably the more advantageous it would be to you to, to break it up. And if um, uh, you have a kind of a more general introduction that kind of sets the tone and, 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 and sets kind of the more general um, uh, general uh, ideas uh, that you're going to be addressing and then go into something more specific, I think that's fine. Um, I'm, a, I'm a fairly big believer in sectioning um, if you, if, if for the longer pieces. Um, it just makes, uh, makes it easier to kind of process the information. So I don't think there's a rule about this, but um, for me as an editor, um, 
I think I think uh, either way is fine. But if again, if the ideas are such that they flow better sectioned out, I would say do that. Great. Um, the next question is: I have a piece that crosses disciplines. The ideas of one discipline are generally foreign to the other. How much of the piece should go towards explaining the foreign concept? Mm. Well, um, I think um, I think this is an issue that um, I've seen in certain manuscripts where uh, uh, ideas might be um, uh, kind of yanked in from from a discipline that's not seen traditionally um, in our journal. Um, in that case, there has to be um, some kind of explanation or even a simplification uh, of the issues so that the uh, uh, reviewers and readers um, can kind of understand it enough to in have it integrated um, into the kind of mainstream um, ideas that, that, uh, that I think you're saying is, is the f focus of, of the article. Uh, so I think it is important. Um, uh, for instance, I get manuscripts, let's say, from economists who uh, are talking about ideas that they're very familiar with uh, within their particular discipline, uh, but the average social gerontologist might not know uh, the kind of jargon and, and the, the, the kind of analytic concepts that, uh, that the person is, is referring to. So I think it, it does have to be explained. It does take space to do that, but it is important. Thank you. I have another question that says, what does alternative explanation is too compelling mean? Are, are okay. compelling results an issue? Yeah. Um, what I mean by that is that there's a, an alternative way of explaining your results that is, when I say too compelling, it, it's, um, it's, um, it, it means it, it's, a, it's a, um, an explanation that um, uh, not only can't be rejected, but it might be the uh, the true explanation for uh, what it is you're studying. And I used race and, and income as as an example, but um, you could you know to to use that again, uh, you could say that if you find that um, uh, different racial groups have uh, different outcomes on your dependent variable, um, and you haven't controlled for um, uh, let's say socioeconomic status. Um, <clears throat> then you're, um, it's, it's too compelling to think that um, social class or socioeconomic factors would be the true explanation, not race or ethnicity. So that's what I mean by compelling. Um, you know, there will always be alternative explanations, but you don't want ones that are um, very obvious that um, potentially could invalidate the conclusion you make about your key uh, predictor that you're, you're focusing on. Great. Um, I have another question that asks your opinion about the trend to no longer have reviewers be anonymous. Well, um, at JGSS we um, have a double blind, so neither party um, knows who the other one is, and I thought that was uh, important to maintain. So um, I guess my my opinion is um, I'm against uh, that trend, um, and uh, it's uh, reflected in the policies of, of the journal. Um, I think particularly um, having the um, reviewers uh, blinded um, is, is you know, that's particularly important. Um, there was a time at JGSS, and probably talking at least 20 years ago, uh, where authors had the option to reveal themselves or not to the reviewers. And um, I found that, as an author, uh, somewhat uh, peculiar. So I decided that that would not be the uh, strategy we would take, and that everybody would be blind. I think it maximizes fairness, not that people are not able to sometimes guess who the author is, but at least to the extent that we can maintain that, that sort of um, you know, objective um, uh, barrier, we, we, you know, we try for that. So I'm in favor of double blind when possible. And we'll have this be the last question, and it's about the reviewing process. Um, there's some interest in whether um, the manuscript that is revised and resubmitted is returned to new reviewers or the previous reviewers. And then on top of that, how to handle um, reviewer comments that um, are perceived as incorrect because there was not um, careful review of the article. Yes, the, the, the revised manuscripts, um, uh, when we can, uh, which most of the time, uh, go back to original reviewers. Um, Sometimes the original reviewers do not want to see the manuscript again. They have that option uh, to uh, check a box off that says, do not send me a revision, in which case uh, we have to go to a, 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 often another reviewer. Now, this is at the editor's discretion. If an, an article is a, 
you know, a minor revision, uh, we might um, send it back to only uh, one or maybe two uh, of the reviewers. Now, JGSS has traditionally used three reviewers, which makes it an outlier compared to the other JG uh, journals. Uh, but if we're doing three reviewers, we might only go with two in a revision. Um, and uh, if an article is a conditional accept, maybe only one, probably the most critical reviewer. But sometimes we do have to uh, appoint new reviewers. And uh, uh, they do get the paper trail. This is a lot of work for them to, um, to look at the initial submission, the first round of reviews, and to come up with uh, a critique. Reviewers often come up with new things, and which I think are, can be very legitimate, and this could be very useful. Um, but we also um, try to get them to um, concentrate on the issues that were raised initially. Uh, but it's almost invariable that they'll come up with something new, which again is going to improve the the article. Um, the second question. Um, I'm sorry. Refresh. Regarding mind. reviewer comments that um, are perceived as oh, incorrect because it wasn't fully read. Yeah, um, I think this is often uh, something you need to write to the editor about. And I've gotten some personal notes that say, um, you know, I, I think this particular issue um, probably reflects a misreading of what I intended, or um, you know, I, um, uh, you don't want to say that it was poorly poorly read, but um, to kind of um, couch it as a um, uh, maybe an issue that you're, you're struggling with uh, because you uh, uh, don't see it in the same way as the reviewer does, and uh, to get the editor's um, either the editor's opinion um, or to put that in the editor's mind when um, he or she is uh, doing uh, the review, because I think it is important to uh, uh, to to point that out, because there's so many manuscripts coming through and so many issues uh, to deal with as an editor that to to kind of get on the mental map of of the editor for your particular article on that on that issue uh, might be um, might be important to do as you um, especially when you resubmit it and in your letter to the editor to make that kind of bold to uh, to highlight that, that issue. Okay, so I think we're out of time. Yes. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Silverstein, and I hope everybody on the call found this uh, incredibly useful. Um, you will be prompted with a survey upon closing um, this webinar session, and we do encourage you to um, complete that survey as best as possible um, to help inform us on future webinars. So thank you very much, and um, we appreciate your attendance. Okay. Thank you all.